Hello, everyone. I'm Hans Engel from the Directors Guild of Canada. Thank you for joining us for this year's online version of DGC Visionaries. Over the last few years, DGC Visionaries has become a must attend event at many of our top film festivals, bringing together some of the most interesting filmmakers with films at the festivals. This year, we're taking Visionaries online and sharing it clear across the country, highlighting as many brilliant filmmakers as we can. All DGC Visionary sessions are being recorded and will be posted on the DGC National YouTube channel. I'm thrilled and honored to be here with these guests. We're speaking with documentary filmmakers Liz Marshall and Shelley Saywell about Liz's new film, Meet the Future, that premiered at this year's Hot Docs Film Festival. And I cannot think of anyone better to lead this conversation than Shelley Saywell. Shelley's a documentary filmmaker and author. She's directed and produced more than 20 independent films over the past 30 years, focused on social issues and justice, with a particular emphasis on women in conflict and women's rights. Shelley's won numerous international and Canadian awards for her work, including an Emmy for investigative journalism, two Best Canadian Documentary Awards at Hot Docs and Director in Focus, 20 Gemini and Screen Awards and nominations. Her films have screened at festivals around the world including numerous screenings at IDFA. Her feature documentary, A Child Century of War, was shortlisted for an Academy Award. WIFT presented her with a Creative Excellence Award in 2010. And aside from her own films, Shelley was executive producer in Aisha Jamal's A Kandahar Away in 2019, Liz Marshall's film Water, I'm assuming Water on the Table in 2010, and Melissa Fung's Captive, uh, now in post-production. She's author of Women in War, Penguin Viking, 1986, and contributing editor to Ourselves Among Others uh, for St. Martin's Press. She's written for Huffington Post, Chatelaine, Women's World, and other pu publications. And Shelley's currently writing a memoir. I'm thrilled to introduce our featured director. Liz Marshall is an award-winning Canadian filmmaker. Since the 1990s, she's written, produced, directed, and filmed diverse international and socially conscious documentaries. Her work has been released theatrically, been broadcast globally, made available digitally, and has screened for hundreds of grassroots communities around the globe. Liz's feature-length films explore social justice and environmental themes driven by strong characters. The impact of Liz's critically acclaimed documentary, The Ghosts in Our Machine, is reflected in an extensive global evaluation report funded by the Doc Society. Marshall's current feature documentary, Meet the Future, which we're talking about extensively tonight, chronicles the birth of the clean, cultured, cell-based meat industry in America through the eyes of pioneer Dr. Uma Valetti. Previous titles include Midian Farm, Water on the Table, the HIV AIDS trilogy for the Stephen Lewis Foundation, uh, the War Child Canada Much Music Special, Musicians in the War Zone, and the 1995 a music documentary archive of folk icon Annie DeFranco. It is my pleasure to welcome Liz Marshall and Shelley Saywell. Come on in. And there they are. Welcome to both of you. Hello, hello. <laughs> Wonderful to be here. Now, before I turn it over to you guys, I just want to point uh, the Q&A button out to those tuning in. It's at the bottom middle of your screen. That's where you can type questions in, and Kelly will be looking for those questions throughout the conversation. She'll try to get to them, as many as she can. She may not get to all of them, but she will absolutely try. Really looking forward to this conversation, and I'll see you at the end. Have a great time. Thanks, Hans. Thank you, Hans. So, Liz. Hello. Hello. I feel like I've known you since you were a baby. I know it hasn't been that long, but I'm thrilled to be able to do this with you tonight and to celebrate your work and particularly your latest film, Meet the Future. Uh, it feels almost like the next chapter a continuation of a body of work that I've been privileged to see grow. I've, I've had so many conversations with you from the idea when it was formed, all the challenges, the concerns. 
I can say the struggles, the decisions, the creative decisions that you've, that you've made, and they've all come from your heart. I know you so well. Uh, you're so deeply personally invested in each film, and yet you're also a cinematic master, uh, someone I look up to and whose films truly inspire me. So thank you for asking me to moderate. I'll do my best. But this night's all about you and this wonderful new film. Well, Shelley, let me say, and, and this, you know, is an honor to have you moderate. You um, have really been the most significant filmmaker in my professional trajectory, in my career path, that has mentored me and helped shape uh, my path forward. I remember our first conversations, you know, dating back to the year 2000. Yeah. When I was really embarking on social issue documentary filmmaking and realizing that I had that passion yeah. and I looked to you and so many times along, along the way, you've just been there for me. And I, I want to honor that publicly because um, I feel that I know that without mentors, we don't thrive, we don't grow mm -hmm. to be all that we can be yeah and you've really been uh, honestly like a, a really good friend but also um an excellent mentor so thank you for that you've also mentored many uh other documentary women in this country and um so here we are today and um i also want to acknowledge where i am right now so um i'm at the historic joy kagawa house in vancouver i'm i'm honored to be a writer in residence here mm -hmm. and to also be reading the masterful Obasan uh, mm -hmm. by Joy Kagawa. I'm rereading that book and it's just absolutely stunning work of fiction. Um, and uh, I'm here developing and working on my first fiction script. So I need to mark that by saying that because it's such a significant pivot um, that I'm consciously making and, and, and actively engaged in while I'm here. Wow, that's very exciting. I didn't actually know that until yesterday. Um, so for all of you out there who are joining us in this room, it's the new thing, obviously, that we're all connected. We know filmmaking, all of you who are filmmakers watching, we know how lonely the process of filmmaking can be. Um, it's so internal, it's so personal. Um, and I think that's why these connections tonight to share the kind of journey that you've taken to make these films, to make this particular film, uh, the decisions that you've made, the choices that you've made, and, and in some cases, the sacrifices that you have to make, we all know them, um, should, should frame this discussion. But first, I think for anyone who wasn't lucky enough to see Liz's new film in Hot Ducks, we should play the I guess the trailer for it. Sure, that sounds good. Let me make sure I'm pronouncing your name right. Dr. Uma Valetti, right? That's correct. He is CEO of Memphis Meats. Uma, lab-grown meat brings to mind frankenfood, playing with nature. You're basically cloning meat, right? Is that what you're doing? We are not cloning anything. We are growing these cells. So these cells are growing and becoming muscle tissue. It's so funny. Like, you have to change your thinking and your vocabulary to even discuss the subject. It's, it's just such an <laughs> odd uh, new, new concept. I'd like to be an investor because I have a feeling this might be one of the biggest IPOs in the history of the world. <laughs> This has been something that I've been dreaming about since I was a kid. Can you grow meat from animal cells? My whole life, all I wanted to do was be a chef, and I wanted to focus on meat. My training is in biomedical engineering. I was actually a tissue engineer. I took an urban agriculture class that really opened my eyes to what we were doing to the planet just by feeding ourselves. We want to separate the animal from meat making the division cycle of the cell rather than the reproductive cycle of the animal. This is a huge, huge paradigm shift. These small tissue samples will produce extremely large amounts of meat. 
From the consumer perspective, we're facing a brave new world. Technology that was once the stuff of science fiction is now becoming a reality. There's a lot of fear around the intersection of food and technology. The manufacturers of lab-grown products should be required to invest in their own market and not ride the coattails of beef's success. Right now is a make-or-break moment for clean meat. I'm signing a letter with the largest meat trade association of the world. Felt like the right thing to do. We are going to bring everybody under this tent. The meat industry knows that they can't meet the demand. If the demand for meat is going to double by 2050, there is no method of production at their disposal now that would satisfy that hunger for meat. I just want to make sure you're looking at this as a very big historic thing in this vault. That is meat. Congratulations on this film. I hope everyone gets a chance to see it. There's so much I didn't know about the topic, the subject. I didn't, I mean, I even, even though I think you mentioned that you were working on this to me over the years, um, what I loved, one of the things I loved the most about the film is in a very dark time, it, A, it's incredibly timely. It brings up all kinds of issues that we can get into. Um, from pandemic issues to morality issues to obviously climate change, um, cruelty to animals, water, but it's hopeful. And I love that it's hopeful. And I love that you have always looked for a way with these heavy subjects that you tackle and things that you care about. You've found a person or people to let us into the story. It's almost, I mean, if you were a casting agent, I'd say you cast so magnificently. Oma's just such a great character. He just makes me smile. I'm smiling with him through the film. Tell me about the process of taking what, to some people in a room, if you were pitching, it might sound like, okay, uh, a new meat product. You know, that doesn't sound very visual. You're an incredibly cinematic filmmaker. Um, you took an idea that, you know, could have been a, a newspaper article and made it into this epic film. So what was your process? How did you find Uma and start conceiving this film? Okay. So first of all, yes, very, very challenging film to make because it was always teetering on that risk of, you know, how is this not a commercial for a new idea, a new product an, uh, for a company? And, you know, I'd, I'd never focused at all on the birth of a new industry or, a, or food for that, for that matter. And, and Uma Valetti is, you know, uh, a, a successful cardiologist turned entrepreneur. Uh, he took a passion driven, uh, risky career turn in 2015 after being trained at the Mayo Clinic and succeeding so well in that field in America. And he founded Memphis Meats, this little tiny you know, startup company. And it was in early 2016 after his company unveiled the world's first uh, clean meatball. That's what it was called back then, or cultured meatball. Um, and the light bulb went off for me right away. I thought, this is solution focused, it's active and unfolding. This is potentially a, a fascinating person. And um, for me, from a moral perspective, it, it's a convergence. It brings together all the issues that I'm equally passionate about, human rights, environmental rights, animal rights. And as you know, Shelley, um, I focused for the first 10 years of my uh, career on human, global human rights stories. And, and, you know, I was, you know, that's when we first met. And so for me, I, I wanted the timeliness of a story, but I also wanted something that brings everything together from my perspective. Mm -hmm. 
it does bring all those things together. And now, of course, in light of COVID, um, and we're under the grip of this global pandemic that is a zoonotic disease, uh, that is, you know, zoonoses is uh, as, a, as a direct result of, of germs that, are, that jump from animals to humans. And so we need urgent solutions to our uh, food production system. And sustainability is something I care deeply about and believe we all need to get behind that. And, you know, there's lots of different solutions that are underway. And so this is one solution that's underway that is really novel and brilliant. I mean, it could be, you know, in some ways, the biggest idea of the century. Um, so, but going back to your question around, you know, how do you pitch that and what are the risks? Um, well, first of all, uh, another big risk was sinking, sinking myself into this, committing myself to this story um, back in 2016 and not having a clue where it was going. Memphis Meats could have just, you know, faded away or dissolved or collapsed. Uh, because maybe it was ahead of its time, but in fact, it's a it's a it's an idea whose time has come, and I was following an instinct. And but it doesn't mean that that was not challenging. Because when I would pitch the idea, it was just so hard to get off the ground. And I remember in 2018, um, hot dogs. Uh, you know, I was accepted to pitch at the forum and thankfully I had the documentary channel on board as a partner at that stage. And I was in early production technically at that stage, even though we'd been shooting for two years and pitching at the forum to, you know, that big intimidating table of decision makers. I literally could have divided it 50, 50 in half. Um, with those that were leaning into the subject and where the light bulb went off like it did for me. Right. And, and then the other half where they were um, resistant and extremely skeptical and for good reason. Mm -hmm. um, but still the question was, how is this not a commercial for a company, which is a very legitimate question. And uh, and and that was that be, I became obsessed with that question, and so it was something I had to, you know, in a really polite way, um, always remind Uma and his small team at Memphis Meets that this film is a film; it is not a commercial. And they know nothing about films, <laughs> as we know when we focus on people and these ideas or organizations, whatever it is that we're focusing on. They never understand fully what it is that we're doing and but they were very keen and I think I really owe it to Uma for having that early foresight and trust because it is about trust ultimately and if, especially when you're making a character driven film that relationship is everything everything and and so I chose him as that personal entry point to humanize this very kind of scary topic to some people or you know back in 2016 it was it was viewed as franken food as you heard in the in the trailer and that's certainly included in the film um, but now in 2020 when climate the climate emergency and the this pandemic that we're under the grip of everything is so different now in a way. It's more accelerated in terms of urgency and in terms of the need for solutions. So I feel that, you know, the film has arrived exactly at the right time, even though it's hard mm -hmm. to have a film as part of a COVID um, release, <laughs> you know, because from an industry perspective, our industry perspective, it's challenging to be on, you know, to be releasing a film after making it for four years during COVID. But at the same time, it is more relevant because of COVID. It's so relevant. Um, you've touched on so many things I want to get to. Um, 
So I'm going to, I'm going to take us back a little bit. So the first time I met Liz, she walked into my office. Uh, she looked about 10 years old. I'm not exactly sure. Um, having just come back from Sierra Leone. Remember that with War Child? And I was about to take off for Sierra Leone and you very kindly came in and you talk about the fact that I mentored you. I guess I have, but you also helped me tremendously because you were the only person I knew who'd been there. And that was a, uh, a very, um, it was a terrifying time in that war. And my focus was on children. You had just come back from, I think it was War Child. Yes. So, um, you know, our, our, the way our uh, morality and our interests and our social passions have converged has always been what, what has connected us. We also know how tricky it can be um, to, to take on these subject, big subject films, these heavy stories, and not turn people off. People who have compassion fatigue, people who just want to turn on Netflix at night and escape. Um, and, and, you know, the world is not getting any easier to bear witness to. It's also becoming more difficult to do those kinds of films. But you have managed through this latest film to take a, a pretty dark canvas. I mean, I watched the film in, in places with a lump in my throat because, not, not because of uh, the wonderful visionary um, which is the perfect name for tonight because it's also Uma is a visionary, you're a visionary, but the um, idea, the science of this that could potentially be life changing and change our planet. Um, but the backdrop of it is, is, is still pretty dark. You know, what, what's happening to those animals, what we're doing to our planet. So that idea of storytelling and wrestling with how do I go there? How do I do a film about animal rights, for example? Um, who's gonna watch? How do I get people to watch? And I remember, Liz, you calling me um, when you were just starting um, The Ghost in Our Machine and saying, I figured out how to do it. I found the way I'm going to do it. And because I, I remember talking to you and saying, I can't even watch, you know, PETA commercials. Like, I actually can watch almost anything but cruelty to animals. And you said, no, I figured out how to do it. So you find these great storytelling devices through these wonderful people. That's what you do so well. One of the things you do so well. Mm. And then you convince them to let you in. So was it easy for Uma to let you in? No. What did no. that take? I'm sure you started with no money and just your, you know, your, your oh, iPhone. Exactly. Um, I started with, um, yeah, just go flying down there. And well, so you mean with Uma? Do you want me to talk about the first shoot or, or the yeah. Ghost in Our Machine? Well, whichever one. I mean, the Ghost in Our Machine actually is in many ways the setup for Meet the Future. I feel like everybody should watch them both. That's true. But you know, I've done interviews about this and I feel like Water on the Table is also part of that because yeah. Meet the Future is not only about our treatment of animals and it's, you know, the misery that billions of animals are subjected to through our transnational meat production system, the industrial system. But it's also wreaking havoc on our planet. It's thankfully uh, part of mainstream discourse and media now, where through that climate lens, we are talking about the damages to the planet as a result of industrial production of meat. And so I, I couldn't be happier for that discussion to be prevalent, finally. Um, because it's always been an inconvenient truth. Um, it's much easier for whatever reason to talk about uh, the energy sector. But of course, the industrial meat making machine is also the energy sector. And uh, it, it affects, you know, biodiversity, 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions, water, land use. I mean, roughly 45 to 50 percent of the, the world's land surface area is used for animal agriculture. So there's so many reasons why we need to care about this and look at this topic. Um, so, but to your point and question, um, it's true. How do you make a film about something that people don't want to know about? So I think the choice around Meet the Future, I mean, who wants to watch a film about meat? I mean, come on, you know, there's, <laughs> I mean, it is a fetish for many people and that's why um, in the lifestyle TV genre, there are so many shows that are, that highlight and spotlight chefs that work with meat. Um, but see what's happening now is there's more focus on meat alternatives. And there's more focus on, you know, plant-based eating. But anyways, that's a whole other conversation. The, the, the real question is, as a filmmaker, how do we make films about topics that are so challenging? Whether it's war-affected children or sweatshop labor, labor or whether it's, um, you know, about our treatment of animals. And um, you're right. I remember that conversation, too. And I remember you saying that you were like, no, I can't look, I can't see that. And I think that's so reflective. That's such a truthful uh, response because the vast majority of people don't want to, it, they, we don't want to see violence against children and we don't want to see violence against animals because in some ways they're the most helpless. I mean, we could, are, women are also very helpless in, in certain societies and elderly people as well. But children and animals are truly helpless. And um, so in making The Ghosts in Our Machine, which was a 2013 release, um, that obsessed me. I was obsessed with what is the tone? What is the, entry point what is the device and how will we succeed in making something that op that that removes people's blinders in a way that at the end there's a dramatic effect as opposed to smashing people over the head which i don't want to do anyways it it did succeed i mean that was the that's why we did an impact report that's why the Doc Society funded us to do an evaluation and have that impact report. It's very valuable. So, and, yeah. You know, I was just, I was just going to add that um, you managed, I mean, you're a storyteller. That's what you are. You're a storyteller and you use cinematic language to tell your stories. And so the process of the struggle of trying to figure out how do you take this, this topic and turn it into a story and a cinematic journey, um, I, I'd love to, uh, Ryan, if you could play the um, Ghost in Our Machine clip that Liz chose. I think it's actually the opening of the film. Okay. Yeah, sure. By any of the data. The fact is that oh. all animals are sentient and humans are animals. No. Start it from the top. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. that relates to the human-animal relationship is a huge question. It's the next big hurdle of social moral development that humans need to cross. I say next because it's already underway. We're becoming much more Not aware of that. By any of the data. The fact is that all animals are sentient and humans are animals. And we share the basic property of emotions, 
pleasure and pain with other animals. Sentience means the capacity to feel. Uh, it really it refers to a whole spectrum of feelings, from the agony of the worst sorts of pain to the ecstasy of the best sorts of pleasure. The science is there, and it is growing by the minute. And we are deliberately ignoring it because it is inconvenient to recognize it. Sentience is a Now, animals definitely have emotions, but that doesn't mean that they're people. There's one big thing in the brain that separates people from animals, the size of cortex. We've got raw computer power that animals don't have. Animals are not going to fly to the moon. Intellect is what separates uh, people from animals, not emotion. Because it really is the solution to all our ills. Someone once said that animals are another nation. Uh, they're not aliens, they're not property, uh, they're not dangers, but rather they're other beings with whom we share life who have as vested an interest in their own lives as we do. All we need to do is make certain that we don't become the plague, the vermin that takes it all over, but rather make sure that there's always room for them. Because without them, we'd be one hell of a lonely place. I feel like I'm a war photographer and I'm photographing history. I'm photographing changes in history right now in terms of animal rights and where it's going. Wow, I want to watch that again. Um, can you hear me? Please? I can't, I can't hear you. Sorry, it's okay. I'm here. Um, to me, the ghost in our machine is, is, is your masterpiece. Um, it really, I mean, all your films are wonderful, including Meet the Future, but it really, for a lot of us sitting in the audience, the first time we ever saw it, I mean, it was, it's so cinematic. Um, can you, and, and, and you chose, I mean, Joanne was the perfect vehicle on her photography to take you into this really hard terrain that was emotionally wrenching. Um, that I didn't want to go down. I've already said I didn't want to go down that road with you, but I mean, how could I not? You totally seduced us in with those incredible images. Talk a little bit about um, your choice of cinematographer, your choice of how, you've, how you approach your film so that they're much more than just, you know, talking head, subject issue films. Sure. So the, the, the power of the, the visual language and the, the soundscape is to me, you know, that's the form and then content, form and content are equally, they work together, obviously, they're um, partners. So working with a team that really gets that and can really, um, so I work with John Price, um, cinematographer John Price. He has um, a sensibility that is, it's so intimate, it's so naturalistic. He's masterful behind the camera when it comes to um, working with natural light, which I love. Um, I, I'm not afraid of the dark. I like the dark. Um, and, uh, and the poetry of you know, the handheld camera that is steady, but has that breath to it when doing a point of view, character driven, personal, deep dive into a new world. And then 
and then knowing when to pull back and have a sense of scale and symmetry through you know a much more locked off uh, composition and in the case of uh, meet the future a lot of aerials um, to help take us to that sense of scale um, whereas with the ghosts in our machine it's always immersive it's always with joanne and then through joanne and her photographic lens as a photographer we meet the animals and then we're very immersive with the animals because that's the layering of the film because the point of the film is to as you said seduce is to really open people's eyes so remove people's blinders but but ultimately to present animals with agency so to give them screen space to hear them breathe to see their eyes to um to show them and and represent them as sentient creatures because i believe they all are and that is the entire premise of the film is to see the animals that we usually don't see because they're invisible and because they're hidden from us because these industries don't want us to see what's going on i was very inspired um, by my former partner lorena elke she has been a very committed uh, animal rights activist for such a long time and she she challenged me she wanted me to go there and you know she's not a filmmaker um so it was up to me to find the device and the way and the language and everything but if i it was really her coaxing and her moral compass that helped open that up for me i already cared but i didn't i didn't know what i know now and as you know shelly and to the filmmakers that are watching when you spend that much time with a subject and a topic you just become you live and breathe it and it becomes you and it becomes how you start seeing things and experiencing the world and i'll never forget this experience uh, it was visceral uh, i was laid over in new york at the airport and i had been on my first shoot and for some reason i was coming back alone i don't know where the crew was and so i was in the airport waiting for hours for my next flight and all i could see around me were the bits and parts and ingredients that are pervasive and that we are complicit in of animals so all i could see were you know the leather shoes and the le the leather garments and bags and all the you know it just and i could smell the meat being you know made and people consuming it and it just became viscerally a reality for me in that moment and i thought that's what i want the film to do i want the film to create the emotional visceral experience that i'm having in this moment I want people to be able to have their blinders removed, but not in a way that traumatizes them. Yeah. I don't want to be traumatized when I see a film or when I'm learning something new. So <clears throat> I want that to be the experience. And so then I became, that became a, that became a point of uh, research for me and a point of reference for me in my methodology moving forward. And of course it all comes together in the edit suite as we know and i worked with amazing editors roland schlimm who often <clears throat> excuse me works with jennifer bachewell and and nick de Pontier. i mean he's masterful and roderick diogratis um, is also masterful and and I, I loved working with roland on the assembly which took a long time but he has that patience and that genius and then he had to move on to create uh, Jennifer and Nick's film Water. And, and so then Rod came in and, and Rod had, you know, a very, um, a strong um, empathic approach, which was perfect. Yeah. And, you know, and so anyways, working with the right team people, obviously, 
and then Joanne MacArthur and her images as a photographer and her mission in the world to have her work seen. All of it just to me was like a rich sort of brew of like, okay, here's all these elements, here's these stories and this big idea. Now, how are we going to work with this? You know, and it was interesting. I'd never focused, I'd never made a film about a photographer before, but what a great vehicle. Yeah. Right. And, and war photographer about James Notchway. That's one of my favorite films. I love that documentary. So um, anyway, so you found yeah. that. Well, that's right. I love, yeah. I love this image of you sitting in the airport and realizing this is the way you were feeling this, uh, the, the experience of now seeing things differently because you're immersed in this. That's what the film has to be. And I've had those moments in my own films and they're the aha moment. It's like, no, I want the whole film to look and feel like that. And working with a team of people who get you and who, can take your ideas and translate them so beautifully. Um, yes, I, I mean, it's exciting just to hear that process because it's hard to, to, hard to know when it's going to happen. It's hard to know when, I mean, I, I guess the brain's an, an, an interesting thing because you're absorbing and you're thinking it through and you're troubleshooting and then suddenly there it is. That's what the film has to feel like. It's a feel, isn't it? It's a feel. And the feel for a visual medium, it's also really a feel. I love that also you do such amazing soundscapes. And I, I want to get to your work with Maud Barlow. I want to get to the history of your, your filmmaking. But you have brought me just back to one of my favorite scenes in Meet the Future, which is a soundscape. It's close to the top of the film. Um, and you go really big. You're with Uma and his startup company and it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of around the tables and, and they're trying to figure out how to do, you know, how to realize this huge dream they have. Um, and then you just leave that and go really big with those big wide shots and just music. And the impact of that, actually, I felt like crying because those shots. Uh, they they were in the trailer, I believe. Sorry, I've seen it a few times. I believe the aerial, it. yeah. The aerial shots where you actually see what we do to the, our animals. Um, mm -hmm. And there's there's more further into the film, but I love that you just stopped and let the images and the soundscape tell the story. Give us the backdrop that we need at that point. Sure. So first of all, I'll say that. Meet the Future is a much more intellectual film because it's about a big new idea. It's about a big new idea that is grounded in food technology and science. And because Uma is, you know, he's a, well, he's a former cardiologist and he is an entrepreneur. So it has a different tone and feel than The Ghosts in Our Machine. You know, every film has its own language that is um, informed and and inspired by the elements that exist and the person that you're focusing on. So with with Uma and with the concept of this meat innovation, which, by the way, for people watching, it's such a big idea to even understand. Um, it's the, the, the creation, the, the production of real meat from animal cells without the need to um, you know, breed, raise, and slaughter billions of animals. And wow, what a game changer idea. You know, you're, it, it opens the mind to what is possible and the miracle of what is possible, what we're capable of. You know? And so, um, so the film is more intellectual and um and whereas the ghost in our machine is doesn't have nearly as much dialogue so it it i think it contains a different energy and um essence for sure um now the clip that you wanted to play is the intro of the film actually it's it sort of sets up yeah the environment and and sets up the idea and uma really quickly so 
Is that the, that's the clip that we yeah. want to play? Okay. Yeah. All right, roll it. cells that did not require a cow to be slaughtered. something that I've been dreaming about since I was a kid. Thinking about the impact on human lives and animal lives and the ills of food production. Are you back? Yes. Yeah. I'm back. No, beautiful opening. That isn't actually the part I meant, but that's okay. Because everybody out there will either watch the film after this or has seen it. Now, it was the big, big epic, you know, I, I guess drone shots of the farm. Yeah, the reveal the, of the, 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 the just it just that's the part that made me cry. This part actually didn't make me cry. Um, yeah, that that uh, so that I'll just say a couple of words about that sequence, which comes about twenty minutes into the film. Um, you know, we need to, th this is a film about a potential solution and, it, and it's immersive in the sense that it really stays with Uma and his small team uh, for the vast majority of the film. Um, but then we also need to springboard out. And that is also such a challenge when you're making a character driven film. It's like, how do you get out of that uh, immersion uh, to represent other points of view um, to see, you know, um, to have a wider lens, uh, literally and figuratively, um, and and that is such a challenge always. Um, but, but also with this kind of film, with this kind of topic, absolutely essential to have that. And so there is one point in the film at the twenty-minute mark where we springboard way, way out to take a look at the problem which is experiencing, witnessing uh, from an aerial perspective, different shots, um, and then inside these industrial barns, um, the realities of, uh, and what is meat production. And, you know, like I said previously, talking about the ghost in our machine, these realities are largely hidden from our view. In fact, there is ag-gag legislation um, in uh, different states in the US and now in Canada as well, um, that prohibit whistleblowers, journalists from taking images within these spaces and even on the land itself. So even flying a drone is illegal. So, you know, <clears throat> it was so important to have those shots. And how do you do it? Where do you get it from? 
these are all very considered careful decisions that you make. And so we did have one drone operator um, for the more cinematic, um, you know, those vast um, spaces um, where you see, and it goes on and on for as far as the eye can see, you, you see these feedlots and the amount of land that is taken up to produce uh, meat. It's so cumbersome. Um, anyways, and then inside the barns as well. So we got that from a couple of different sources. But um, it was important to not have a voiceover at all mm -hmm. <clears throat> during that sequence. I didn't want it to be um, didactic. I wanted it to speak for itself. It and it, it can, it has the power to speak for itself because the strength, the gravity of the imagery. Um, and then the, the score is, is subtle. And, um, you know, our composer, um, Igor, is just phenomenal. And it, he created a really subtle score, um, but so effective. Um, yeah, so it was important to find that, um, the right tone, where you want it to be very dramatic, but you don't want to overdo it in a way that the person receiving it feels totally manipulated. So you want it to have a certain uh, critical distance at the same time as being, look, let's see the truth, because the truth is important. And I also think just, I mean, you're, the editing is brilliant and where that scene comes up, you're ready for it because you know that there are these, you know, there is, there is hope, there is this amazing uh, potential. And people like Uma, well, Uma, but, and his team who are just, you know, kicking ass and, and, and it will change things. And it, it will also change the way we look at things. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, I just want to, I want to plug quickly that our editors, Caroline Christie and Roland Schlimm, are both nominated, um, dual nominated under the DG, for the DGC for oh. best editor of this film. Oh, well deserved. So we're rooting yeah. for them. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So I have um, mm -hmm. somebody um, anonymous has said, I missed the name of the photographer um, that who you said you loved. Um, and are there, uh, so I, I think we're talking about um, Joanne MacArthur. Joanne MacArthur. Oh, uh, <clears throat> James Notchway of War Photographer as well was another reference. And she's also, she or he is also asking for any other films that have inspired you. Oh, okay. Wow, lots. That might be a long list. Maybe yeah. it's a you could keep it I, Okay, sure. I'll, I'll say that I love Citizen Four by Laura Patois. I think that uh, this is an excellent film. I mean, talk about incredible access at a, at a and the, in the immediacy of that access and being there in the moment mm -hmm. as that drama unfolds and like you just feel it the whole time. I loved her choices and you know that it's her with her camera there the whole time with him. I love the black screen and how, uh, she, you know, because they had to have this special coded clandestine way of communicating. And I like the choices around having that communication on a black screen. You know, there were just a lot of things about that film that I thought were strong. And, um, I also loved uh, Knock Down the House, I have to say. I saw it probably four times. Did you like that film? I haven't seen that film. It's about- um, Okay, it's on my list. It's on my, my COVID it's on, list. It's on Netflix. Okay. It's about, it's about AOC. And it's another f female filmmaker who was there with her camera. She was behind okay. that. Oh, I'm, I'm in um, for that. Yeah, so it's it, it's a really strong film. I have to, those are just, you know, I could go on and on, but those are two sort of in the last few years, two films that stand out for me. Well, speaking of how, um, how Laura got her footage and the ways in which I remember you starting to shoot because you didn't have any money and you didn't always have John Price and you did a lot of your own shooting. And oh, yeah you know, films like Water on the Table is a bit of a mix of yep. very intimate um, moments where you just grab the camera and you're just there and protests and marches and so on. And then um, 
and then the bigger cinematic scenes. Um, so that brings me to a question. Liz, how did you manage, to, uh, this is from Nikki Cole. Hey Nikki, how, uh, Liz, how did you manage to get the drone footage and indoor barn footage? Did you <laughs> shoot in places, uh, I, I think she means where it's legal or was it legal? It's how not legal. Times did you break the law? <laughs> it's not legal at all to, to film in these places, right? Um, so you have to, first of all, I have a great lawyer and I learned so, isn't it amazing how much we learn doing our work, Shelley? Yeah. How much you learn about law. Like you, we have uh, a responsibility to push the envelope and to, you know, there's, a, there's enough public interest and enough public concern about what's going on in those places that, um, and, and I have enough documentation that shows that I, I, I was continuously, uh, um, that, my, that my efforts to interview and to film in those places was rejected, that it's like, okay, well then I'll just have to take a different back door and figure it out. I can't tell you how it was done, but I can tell you that our drone operator uh, is phenomenal and uh, he did a wonderful job and um, you know he, he he's been working for many many years filming you know um, uh, environmental issues and animal rights issues and uh, he's wonderful at what he does and then uh, Mercy for Animals is uh, a, an amazing advocacy organization in the states that provided um, footage courtesy um, of, of some other shots there. So Nikki has responded, fantastic. Just trying to figure out how you deal with that with broadcasters. Oh, that's another whole conversation. Nikki. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the yeah, e &O because part of the film. E &O, yeah. Um, so you need yeah. a good lawyer and you need a good argument behind why you're doing what you're doing. And obviously I'm making a film about conventional meat production and a solution to it. And so obviously we need to see uh, conventional meat production at some point in the film. And so we had to do that. Mm. It's part of the story. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's all, all about risk taking and different, I mean, every film's a yeah. series of steps of risk taking, I think, from the creative and on these topics, the legal. Oh, it's so, called, there's I mean, Liz so many called, risks. Liz has called me, we've called each other in tears after having yeah. finally captured something on camera in sort of in an investigative way on uh, having your e o lawyer come and say it has to come out of the film you're going to get sued um and fighting and going back and fighting them for everything um to keep the veracity of your film and what you fought so hard to to capture yes yes and and back to that word risk there are so many risks when you do this work and you just what i say to um you know emerging filmmakers people that i that i mentor is that if you don't have that sort of fire within you to take those risks and to do whatever it takes and to um mm -hmm. persevere i think that's the key word perseverance if you don't if you don't really feel motivated or have that perseverance then i don't think you have what it takes to do this work because it is so hard it is so challenging it's also deeply rewarding um but you know um shelly when we first met we were sharing war stories because we've both shot in war zones that's how i started my social issue documentary um, um path um, because I also have a love for music documentaries. That's actually how, that was my entry point in the 90s, like fresh out of film school. Um, I, I was on the road with Ani DeFranco and that was a thrill. And I love music documentaries and I'm actually developing as a writer director. Um, I'm in development, working with some producers um, right. to make a music documentary. And it's so, such a relief and so much fun to do something a little different. Um, but war zones um that that is 
th these are all war zones in a way, right? Like, um, I don't know. No, they're all tough in their own way. They're all your children in their own way, and they're all tough in your own way. And um, yeah. Shelley, would you go back to any of those places now in today's world? I don't mean well, obviously not during COVID, but I mean post. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to because you know it's it's they're always calculated risks. Um, you're responsible for your team. Uh, you're responsible for the subjects of your film. There's uh, that element of trust. I mean, you know this so well because you make films largely through the eyes of a central character. And so you have to establish, as I have in my films, a really intimate relationship of trust. You have to talk to the subject of the film and say, when, you know, whatever your um, boundaries are, we have to decide so that the camera can essentially stay on, but I will not cross certain lines with you. And so, you know, we started a discussion about Meet the Future, talking about you did not want to make uh, an industrial film or a promotional film for them. Where are the lines of trust? You know, they might have wondered if you were going to do, at some point, you never know if you're going to be trying to dig up dirt on them. You know, there's this whole place where you, you have to get on the same page. And one film I made, and this, not, this is not about me tonight, but one film I made, I actually scooped myself because I did some hidden camera work for an organization and it was so important, they wanted to get it on the front page. It went on the front page of the star before the film came out. And I was wrestling with that. It's like, you know, but geez, I, this is so important and so integral to my film and it was such a scoop. And yet I gave it away because the people I was making the film about this was their life. This was, they needed to get that message out. So the choice was pretty clear. You know, that trumps, excuse, I hate that word, that, but that trumps, know. Um, you know, whatever, you know, as a filmmaker, you feel you have ownership over. But how did you, uh, let's talk about Maude for a minute. Like, how did you gain her trust? I mean, she's an amazing woman. She was doing this incredible work. You were just starting out. And the reason I became, I came on as a totally. producer, the reason I came on as a producer was because I think it was TVO called me and said, there's this, this woman named Liz Marshall and she's got this great idea, but we don't really know her and she hasn't done all that much. Uh, and I said, oh, she can totally do it. She has to do it. She's amazing. Um, and then I think they became more comfortable if I would come in as exact. And I said, you know what? She's not going to need any help. And you really didn't. But but Thanks you, for doing uh, that. But, you, yeah, <laughs> no, but no, I was thrilled to be able to, because that film needed to be made. That was a brilliant film too. Um, so how did you get, how did you get uh, Maude to sign on with you? I have to say that, so that was, Water on the Table was released in 2010. And so we started making that film in 2008. And she was, and I know this now in retrospect, because it was my first feature. I'd made broadcast things and things for NGOs prior to that, but it was my first feature doc. And so in, in a lot of ways, it was kind of like my first film, right? Like you said, um, even though I'd been out there working my ass off for a long time and I'd been to all those war zones and everything. But um, Maud Barlow was a... a uh, it was like a gift that she gave me because she said to me when I approached her, I'd read her book and it was um, Blue Gold was the name of that book. She's, she has written many books about the world water crisis and she's a remarkable public speaker, writer and activist. And she's a Canadian icon really. And I developed an immediate connection with her, but lots of people do because she's so warm hearted and such a engaging person. But we did really truly develop such a nice connection. And I said to her, I'm, I, I'm passionate about this concept of water justice and the, the crusade, the mission that you're on to protect water from it being bought, sold and you know, used on the public, on the free market, um, you know, like running shoes or Coca-Cola. And I started becoming aware of our own water 
um, heritage, our own water rich country. Um, after having traveled to war zones, like I mentioned, and some developing countries where, um, you know, children, people, women don't have access to clean water. And it's really such a travesty. And so I became really fascinated and thought I want to make an environmental film. That was my pivot into environmental issues was with water on the table. And the gift that Maud gave me was she said, yes, you have total access to me, whatever you need and whenever you need it. And she became a friend. And I didn't, it was an easy relationship. And, and I didn't, I mean, I had never done a feature length character driven documentary before, like I said. So I just thought, oh, this is great. I love doing this, you know, and she was just a wonderful and we're, we remain very good friends. And in fact, she's a consultant to me right now, an issue consultant on a speculative fiction script that I'm co-writing with Michael Glassberg. Uh, here at my writer in residency at the Joy Kagawa House. So sometimes you have the, the amazing uh, experience of building a lifelong friendship with someone when you make a film about them. Other times it's a bit more of a business arrangement or, you know, like with Uma, um, Uma Valadi, Meet the Future. Um, it's very cordial, it's very friendly, um, but there's a certain distance like i you know i wouldn't say that we're good friends um at all but but certainly i feel absolutely privileged to have been uh, a witness uh to the rise of his prominence uh which is also in a way kind of what the film is about it's about him as a pioneer and then with joanne MacArthur as a photographer i feel like the film you know in some ways the legacy of the ghosts in our machine is it really helped to um, elevate her incredibly important work in the world. And, and it gave her that global platform. It's not like she wasn't known before that. She was by activist groups, but it really catapulted her into a different place. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of what documentary can do. Yeah. It, it is a remarkable vehicle for elevating people, ideas, moral questions um, and and even social action yeah well well said i mean you know i i think about all the years and all the issues that we both connected on from working for stephen lewis uh you did three films with stephen in africa and i volunteered to do a sort of a a film for him to raise money for the grandmothers and you know there were just all these things we have these heroes in our in our society, like Maude, like Stephen, um, who um, can articulate the, these, these enormous issues and deserve the platform. And it is such a privilege to be able to make films with and about them um, always. And, you know, that sort of leads me quite naturally, if we still have time, into your roots, because you, Liz, not everyone knows this about you unless they've seen Midian Farm. I would really recommend that people do. If you love Liz's work, which I'm sure you do, you should definitely catch this film because this is her personal story. And oh boy, there was some hand holding there too. I mean, that was hard for you. But the amazing thing is you grew up in, a, in an experiment. You grew yes. up in, I mean, it sort of speaks to who you've become and your visionary uh, approach to filmmaking because your parents went back to the land started a commune i'm synthesizing this uh when you were a very little girl and um i think if we have time it'd be great to um maybe you want to set up the clip liz sure because because the clip is about the demise and the, and the collapse. And I deliberately chose that clip just because um, I thought we could set up the premise and then show something that was so hard to make. I, this is my first personal film. Will I make another personal film? Maybe, I'm not sure. Um, I think they are the hardest films to make. 
I mean, we've been talking about all the challenges and the global, you know, risk taking and everything involved in the work that we do. Um, but in a really fundamental way, making Midian Farm challenged me at a core level in a way that I can't even articulate fully. Um, because it was turning the lens, although I'm not really in the film in the present tense, but my archival images are, um, it turned the lens on a part of my history and my story. And the challenge was, how can this story be universal, have resonance that others can relate to? Because it's not very relatable. Not very many people are born into a social experiment, into a intentional community, um, even though that was pervasive in the 1970s. So yes, my parents were leaders. My father became a, a, a charismatic leader. He was worshipped by, uh, you know, a lot of people. Um, and then it all fell apart. And so it was a utopian ideal aspiration. Uh, and those seeds of hope and, and um, wanting to make the world a better place, they were born into me. I feel them within myself. Um, but at the same time, I'm, uh, do I believe in that? Not, I don't know, not really. But anyways, let's take a look. Yeah. <laughs> and then we can talk about personal filmmaking. Well, I think it'll be, yeah. Well, I had a complete breakdown that winter because I didn't have a sense of, I lost a sense of hope. I honestly thought when I left with you children, I would be going away to get better and stronger and would be returning several months later. And of course I didn't, and we didn't. I have learned over time, something that I didn't know then, is that the seeds of joy are also the chrysalis of pain. The steps of that dance are so intertwined. I was impacted by what felt like total collapse. And then after we left the farm, we learned that it all fell apart. The first major trauma that we had was a hailstorm these huge chunks of hail. Just about everything was lost. The hail smashed all the windows. It completely destroyed the garden. It was just like one of those things that you'll never forget. And then the lightning storm splitting the tree, it split it in half. It was our gathering place. It was where we would sing, we would meet there. It was kind of like the heart of the farm. And then we had a very bad flood. And then finally, of course, we had the fire. Oh boy! Oh, oh boy! <laughs> well, actually, it, 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 the, the the film is uh, quite uplifting. <laughs> it is. It has those. It has, a, it has a. 
it has a narrative like an inherent dramatic narrative yeah. arc and that was so exciting to work with yeah and the last shot of that film might, might be my favorite last shot of it oh yeah ever it's, it's um but liz it's Thank you. Kind of getting time to wrap it up and i'm just wondering if you could speak about meet the future where it's going are you doing um a series of screenings with i know it's covid how are you getting it out and how can people see it okay and are you, and are you doing community a, a community screening kind of program like you often do with your film well so community and there's yeah there's lots of screenings happening this month october in canada so documentary channel it it um starting this sunday it it has its premiere on documentary channel then there's a number of repeat screenings if you're if you subscribe to documentary channel and then it goes straight to cbc gem uh, and it will live there for three years which is great because everyone in canada can access the film and it's also part of planet and focus which is i i love planet and focus um, environmental film festival um, and this they've screened all my films so this will be there and then it's it just continues to be at a number of film festivals people can check out uh, the screenings page on the meetthefuture.com website meet is with an m-e-a-t of course and then um, our sales agent is met film sales so vesna kudik out of the uk and she's pitching to all the buyers um so hopefully there's uh you know some some news about you know when the film will actually be released via other networks and platforms um soon um yeah that's fantastic that's it is a good luck with it i i i actually want to invest in the company i mean if i had it <laughs> i would invest in the company i really i i think i mean it's it's really so hopeful it's so hopeful i'm so glad you illuminated this story for us and told this story for us mm, and next time we'll talk about your feature film script i'm so excited or i'll call you later okay good yeah it's very cool okay thank you thank you shelly i love thank you so liz. much you too. yeah i love um, you and thank you both uh shelly liz for that amazing amazing conversation really really uh, wonderful to listen to and to experience. And Liz, uh, as always, congratulations and uh, thank you for such amazing and important work. Uh, mm. I really hope everybody uh, watches this movie and frankly, all your films if they haven't seen them. Um, some of my favorite uh, documentaries. Um, find the links uh, and uh, videos to all DGC 2020 Visionary Sessions at dgc.ca visionaries 2020 liz shelley thank you so much for spending this time with us really appreciate it Thanks. oh it's been wonderful thank you thank you thanks good to well. see you both everyone take care yeah take care yeah bye-bye